If you're a first time home buyer, Greater Moncton is a great place to consider. Our average home price is still among the lowest in Canada at around $360,000. And for the third year in a row, both Zucasa and MoneySense.ca have named Moncton as the best place in Canada to buy a home. So today we're going to walk you through the step-by-step -step process of buying a home in the Greater Moncton area. Hi there, we are Denise and Mark, a husband and wife real estate team right here in Greater Moncton. And if you're either a first time home buyer or someone who is considering relocating to the Greater Moncton area, you'll want to watch this because we'll be taking you through all the steps of buying a home right here. When buying your first home, one of the most crucial steps is saving for a mortgage down payment. This is the initial amount you'll need to pay upfront to secure your loan. The majority of first time buyers can often secure a mortgage with 5% of the purchase price as long as it's under $500,000, but it could be more depending on individual circumstances. The benefit of only paying 5% down is of course that it cuts down the amount of time it will take you to save up and to get you into a home more quickly. But if you're patient or maybe you can get a little help from a parent or a really generous relative and come up with a larger down payment, you'll be able to lower your monthly mortgage payments. Plus, if you can save at least 20%, you can most likely qualify for an uninsured mortgage. Uninsured may sound scary or irresponsible, but we're not talking about insurance to cover your payments in case of unforeseen circumstances. That's separate and always an option. What we're talking about here is default insurance to protect the lender. In Canada, any mortgage with a down payment of less than 20% must be covered by mortgage default insurance, and it's to cover the lender, not you. If you were to default on your loan, the insurance is how the lender would get most of its money back. The insurance comes with a pretty hefty price tag at as much as 4% of the borrowed amount, depending on the size of your down payment. You don't typically have to pay it up front in a lump sum, but it is added to the mortgage amount. So it will definitely have an impact on the amount of your payments. If you're one of the lucky ones who can actually come up with at least 20% down, <laughs> Uh, not only are you borrowing less money, you're also saving the insurance premium, both of which will re reduce your mortgage payments. And since we're on the topic of money you'll need to save, over and above your mortgage uh, down payment, you will need funds for your closing costs. So what are those closing costs? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing to consider is that you'll need a lawyer to complete the transaction. So you'll have your lawyer fees and along with those fees could be adjustments. Adjustments are reimbursements to the sellers for things that have been paid ahead of time. The best example is probably property taxes. If the taxes have already been paid for the year ahead by the sellers, you'll have to reimburse them for the portion of the year from which you're taking possession of the property. Let's say you have a closing day of August 1st on a property and the taxes of $5,000 per year have already been paid. Well, from August 1st to December 31st, there are 153 days left in the year. So the lawyer will divide 5,000 by 365 for the number of days in a year, unless it's a leap year, of course, to get the daily tax amount. So in this case, $13.70 per day and multiply by 153 days in the year where you will have possession to come up with an adjustment in the amount of 2,096 to be reimbursed to the sellers. Other things that could be adjusted are things like remaining oil in an oil tank, remaining propane in a propane tank, uh, prepaid condo fees, or even leftover firewood, although that one's not as common. Up next is a big one that catches some by surprise. When you purchase real estate in New Brunswick, the province collects a 1% land transfer tax. The 1% is charged on either the purchase price or the assessed value of the home, whichever is higher. So if you're buying a $300,000 house, you'll have to pay $3,000 in land transfer taxes at closing. As a very general guide, you should have up to another 4% of the purchase price saved for closing costs. Once you have all or nearly all of your funds saved, you'll need to talk to a mortgage professional. A mortgage professional can work for a bank or a mortgage broker, and each will have their pros and cons. When you work with a mortgage specialist from your bank, one of the potential advantages is the process can be um, 
more streamlined since they have a lot of your information already. They also sometimes have access to exclusive products and competitive rates, especially for existing bank customers. But the main drawback for banks is their limited options since they can only offer products from their institution. A mortgage broker works with many different lenders. So when you work with a mortgage specialist who works with a mortgage broker, they have access to a much broader range of products from several lenders. They can shop around to find you the best deal possible. The potential con to working with a mortgage broker is it may mean a little more legwork for you digging out all the information they'll require since they don't have direct access to your info like a bank does. There are a few different steps to a mortgage approval. The basic step is pre-qualification. This is when a, le when a lender will gather your information and give you an amount that you qualify for. This is fine for when you want to watch the market and see what you can get in your price range, but none of your information has been verified. So the lender is just telling you based on the information that you, you're giving me, here's the price range that you can afford. This is not what you want in your hand when you get more serious about finding a house and are ready to write an offer on the one that you love. Once you've aligned yourself with a good mortgage specialist and you're ready to start shopping, it's very important to get pre-approved. A pre-approval is a step up from a pre-qualification. It's where you'll substantiate the information you provided with proof of income, proof of down payment, debt amount, and those types of things. Once you've gone through that, you will get an amount you are pre-approved for. Just a word of caution, this is still not a guarantee you can get the financing, but it's the, the best thing you can be armed with to start shopping. More on that in a bit, but once you find a house and make an offer that a seller accepts, there'll be another step that's uh, called a full approval. Armed with your pre-approval and ready to start looking at homes, as a first-time home buyer, you'll want to find the right real estate agent for you. You can start by getting recommendations from your friends and family or do some research online. Interviewing a few agents is always a good idea as well because you can gain information about their experience, their level of local mar market knowledge, and their communication style. This will help you find an agent that is compatible with your style and personality since not all realtors are right for all clients and vice versa. Once you find the agent to partner with, discussing your needs, wants, style of house, important house features, and neighborhoods is crucial. Clearly communicate your budget, your preferred locations, and must-haves in a property. Your agent will then use this information to tailor their search and provide you with listings that closely match your criteria. They can also give you insights into market trends. They can negotiate on your behalf and guide you through the entire home buying process. Once you and your agent have found potential homes that might be a good fit, you can start seeing these homes. And this can be a fun part of the process. Touring various properties will help you get a feel for what's available. And during these visits, you can assess each home's potential and how well it fits your wants and needs. When you find a home that you fall in love with and would like to buy, you'll start by writing, writing an offer. Now, one thing to address here is that many first time home buyers are in a price range that has been and still is very competitive in the month in the month of market. We are still seeing multiple offers on homes and when there's competition, we'll often see houses sell over asking price. Mm. So fair warning, this can sometimes lead to some heartache and disappointment, but knowing this upfront can help you as a buyer. You'll need to talk possible strategies with your agent to help make your offer stand out and be the one that is picked. But for now, let's talk about what goes into an offer. Up first is the big one, and that's price. Based on market analysis and your budget, you'll have to determine the offer price that you're comfortable with. Next, you'll need to come up with a closing date or a possession date. Whenever possible, try to propose a closing date that works for both you and the seller. Typically, that'll be 30 to 60 days from the offer date, but it can be negotiable based on both parties' needs. Now let's get into specific conditions. A home inspection can give you peace of mind. It's a great way to understand the condition of the property and to identify any potential issues that may need to be addressed before finalizing the purchase. Inspection results don't come as a pass or fail, but rather in a form of a large report. The report will note things that need immediate attention, things that should be addressed in the not too distant future, but aren't urgent. 
Recommendations to make something safer or maintenance items that should be completed. One thing we should note, particularly if you're a first time home buyer, is that the inspector will find things. Yep. They always do. No house is perfect and it's their job to find things. The important thing, though, is to keep in mind um, that not everything is a massive project and not everything they find always needs to be done. You may also find that it's a big list, but it's often a lot of small items that can easily be addressed with a little time and a few dollars. There are a few ways the condition of inspection can impact the sale. Uh, depending on what's found, as a buyer, you can accept it as is and continue on with the sale, which is always great for both parties. Uh, you can ask the seller to repair specific things at their cost in time for closing. You can ask for a reduction in price in an amount close to the repairs that need to be completed, or you can walk away from the deal altogether. This option is always unfortunate, but it does happen. Sometimes there are just too many unforeseen issues or one major issue that's just too scary for a buyer and it's the only move. One thing we need to mention is it's never good to go into an agreement with a seller with the intention of using the results of an inspection as a tactic to renegotiate. When you write an offer, you do it in good faith with the intention to follow through with the original offer. Next we have financing. Earlier we talked about a full approval being the next step after a pre-approval. This is where it happens. The bank has pre-approved you, but once you have an accepted offer in place, they need to basically approve the house as well. They need to make sure that the money they are lending you is in line with the market values. So they'll gather all the details about the house and the costs associated with it, such as utilities, property taxes, and they may even have it appraised by a professional appraiser. For whatever reason, the full approval for your financing always seems to take the longest when it comes to meeting your conditions. So it's really important to get your mortgage lender involved as soon as possible to help speed up the process. Although not mandatory in New Brunswick, like in other provinces, a property disclosure statement is a four-page questionnaire style document that buyers ask the sellers to fill out. It provides information to the best of the seller's knowledge about the house. The questions uh, address all of the systems of a house, like the roof, the foundation, plumbing, and electrical, and asks about things like any past renovations, any flooding, insurance claims, and known hidden damage. If you're buying a property outside of city limits, the water will probably come from a well. Unlike municipal water, which is treated, well water comes in straight from the source, so you'll want to test the water to make sure it's safe to consume. It's not a complicated process at all. We get sample bottles from a local lab. We go out to the property and follow the instructions to collect a proper sample, which goes back to the lab for analysis. 24 hours later, we get the results back for the basic potability test. You can also opt for a more in-depth test to check for unsafe levels of certain minerals. That, that test takes seven to 10 business days. In the same way the inspection can be handled, the water test would be similar, except the results are pass or fail. If it's a pass, of course, that's great. If it's a fail, sometimes it's just a matter of retesting since samples can easily get mm. contaminated if not done properly. If a second test returns the same results, then you'll need to take additional steps to remedy the situation. It could be as easy as shocking the well, which is done by pouring bleach into the well to kill everything and retesting, or it could become a bigger issue that might require a permanent treatment system. If that's the case, you can decide if you want to accept it as is and absorb the cost of the system yourself, ask for a system to be installed at the seller's expense in time for closing, or ask for a reduction in the price in the amount similar to the cost of the system. Up next, we have insurability. This one's not used as often, but what it does is allow you time to confirm you're able to obtain insurance for the property. It's important to know this, not just for the obvious reason that you wanna make sure you can protect your investment, but also your lender will need proof that it's insured as well. If you can't provide proof of insurance to your lawyer as part of your closing, your lender will not advance the funds, meaning the sale will not close. That would be an absolute disaster on closing day. 
this is in no way advice, and we strongly encourage you to have the discussion with your realtor, but the condition of insurability, it's not one that's always used, uh, particularly if you're buying a typical residential home with standard heating systems that aren't in a flood zone or have uh, other things that could make it challenging to get insurance. But if you're buying a home that might be in a potential flood zone or uses an older heating system like oil or any sort of fire source like a fireplace or wood burning furnace, it's a good condition to add so you can make sure you're not committing to buying a home you won't be able to insure. So those are kind of your standard pre-printed conditions and most common, but conditions can be really anything at all as long as it has five key components. Those are what the actual condition is, who is responsible for doing it, who is responsible for the cost, what's the deadline for it to be completed by, and what is the consequence if it's not? And that consequence would most often come as some sort of reimbursement to the buyer so they can complete whatever work was agreed upon in that condition. Next, we have a few other aspects of a sales contract. As part of your commitment to buy a property, you'll need to submit a sizable deposit. The purpose of a deposit is to show you're serious about the purchase and have all intentions to follow through with it. There's no set amount to be submitted uh, and it'll vary depending on the price of the home and what you and the seller agree on. These days, on the average price of a home in Greater Moncton, say in the three fifty dollars to $400,000 range, you can expect to submit a five to ten thousand dollar deposit you can submit it anytime once you have an accepted offer if for some reason the accepted offer becomes null and void due to one of the conditions we just went over um, not being fulfilled your deposit will be returned to you in full the only time your deposit is at risk is once all conditions have been met and you have what we call a firm deal. At that point, if you were to walk away from the deal, in most cases, you can consider your deposit forfeited to the sellers. Often as buyers, we see things in a house that we would like to remain. These are called chattels in our world. A chattel can be anything that doesn't require tools to remove. Things like appliances, furniture, freestanding storage shelves, and wall art would all be considered chattels. Anything that is screwed in, plumbed in, or wired in would require tools to remove, and they, they are considered fixtures. Examples of those would be things like central back systems, lighting fixtures, water treatment systems. Any fixture must remain with the house unless specifically outlined in the contract that they will be removed. So anything you would like to remain with the house that isn't screwed in, wired in, or plumbed in should be itemized clearly with as much detail as necessary so there is no confusion with what is expected to stay. Once they're listed and agreed upon, it's also stated in the contract that they'll be in good working order for closing. So those are all of the major components of an offer. Once you're able to get an offer accepted, it's go time. In the contract, each of the conditions we went over will have a deadline by which you agree to have fulfilled. This is where it can be a little bit stressful. There's no standard amount of time, but on average, 10 business days is what you can expect to have to meet all of your conditions. Once all of your conditions have been fulfilled, the house is considered officially sold and you need to switch gears and start thinking about closing day. We covered a lot about the costs associated with your closing at the top of the video, but what are the, what are the things you'll need to do? Well, first thing is to get a lawyer. Most buyers wait until they have a firm deal in place to do this, but if your closing date is sooner rather than later, it's a really good idea to secure a lawyer as soon as your offer is accepted. Because once you factor in the 10 business days for completing your conditions, you're down to a little over two weeks, and that will not be enough for some lawyers to do what they need to do depending on their workload. Next on your list, Unless you have friends willing to lug furniture all day in exchange for a few slices of pizza and a couple of beers, you'll want to get movers booked. These guys are busy, so the sooner you do it, the better chance you have of getting them on the day you need them. Up next are your utilities. The most important utility to inform right away of your purchase is MB Power. MB Power will transfer ownership on closing day. If you don't let them know, for one, there will be an additional charge. And more importantly, you may not have power on closing day. This causes a lot of issues because you need power to do closing the closing day walkthrough. This can actually delay your closing into the next day or even maybe the day after. Other utilities to set up could be natural gas if the house has it, and of course your internet. Water and sewer happens automatically when the lawyer registers the sale. 
Now, an important thing to note, we always advise our clients not to book movers or any utilities that require an on-site install for closing day. Mm -hmm. The closing process can take a long time for lawyers and very often we don't get the final word that everything's official until much later in the day, often around supper time. Only then can you get your keys and actually have access to your new home. Until then, movers can't get in and any other uh, utility installers can't get in either. We highly recommend only booking things for the next day. So the big day is finally here. Closing day. Woohoo! Mm. The last step will be to do a final walkthrough. You'll normally do this first thing in the morning and the purpose is to make sure that all the titles that were listed in the offer have been left at the property and the fixtures are in good working order and everything looks the same as when you last saw it. Once you're satisfied with everything, you'll let your lawyer know that all is good. From there, they'll do their part working with the seller's lawyer to get everything finalized. Like we mentioned, this can take a good part of the day and you normally won't get noticed that it has officially closed until later in the day. Buying a home for the first time can be very exciting, but in a market like we've been experiencing in Moncton, if there's one great tip we can leave you with today, it's that you might need to be patient and understand that you may have to visit several homes and possibly write several offers and you will need to be flexible with your wants and needs. Partner with an agent who understands this market and who'll work as hard as you to help you achieve your goals. Speaking of partnering with the right agent, if you think that might be us, you can find our, our contact information below. We'd love to hear from you, so please reach out. Nice segue. Thanks. <laughs> uh, we are Denise and Mark. Thanks for watching and see you next time.